mouse and a human. What could these possibly have in common? Well, I can tell you one very surprising thing, and it's that, that they have the same number of genes, about 20,000. And some of these genes are even the same because they've been conserved by evolution. So how can this be that we get such different creatures? Well, we like to think of genes as all important, and they are very important. Genes make proteins, which are the building blocks for our cells. So how do we get such different creatures from the same building blocks? Well, as any seven-year-old will tell you, it's all about the instructions for how to put those building blocks together. So where are the instructions for our genes? You don't want to lose them. You know that if you've ever tried to put together furniture from Ikea. Well, fortunately, the instructions are built right into the DNA, right into our genome. Genome is a term that we use to describe all of the DNA in all of our chromosomes. And the instructions for our genes are in a part we call non-coding DNA. Non-coding DNA is kind of like the dark matter of the genome. You might have heard about dark matter in physics. It's this stuff that scientists know there must be tons of it out there in the universe, but they can't detect it. And the fact that they can't prove it exists is starting to cause problems for them. But we do know a fair bit about non-coding DNA, and we're making more progress all the time, but in some ways it's a good analogy. There is a ton of non-coding DNA. Genes only make up 1.5% of the human genome, and the rest is non-coding DNA. But if you look at the research that's been done, it's just the opposite. Most research is on genes. So why is this? Well, one major reason is that we just understand genes a lot better, so that makes them easier to study. We cracked the code for how genes make proteins over 50 years ago. And we, so we have a good idea of changes that will break a gene versus changes that will tweak it just a little bit. But we haven't yet cracked the code for non-coding DNA. And that's another way that non-coding DNA is like dark matter. We don't really understand how it works. One reason that we don't have, we haven't cracked the code yet for non-coding DNA is because that this part of the genome is kind of a mess. It looks like a final draft with all sorts of stuff scratched out and written in. If the genome is like the desk at work, the genes are like the top of the desk. They have to be kept nice and tidy so that they can get work done to make proteins. But the non-coding DNA is like the drawers. You can hide a lot of clutter in there along with the instruction manual. And so scientists coined the term junk DNA to describe some of that old historical stuff that's found in our non-coding DNA. However, what's a junk to you might be a treasure to me. And it's actually very hard to prove that a piece of DNA never has any function. So I prefer the term DNA of unknown function. And so while we may not know what all of the non-coding DNA does, we do know that the instructions are in there somewhere. So what do these instructions look like? Well, rather than one master set of instructions, there are individual instructions for each gene. And these take the form of small pieces of non-coding DNA we call enhancers. These enhancers act like switches. They tell a gene when to turn on and where to turn on so that it turns on at the right time and place. And enhancers are one of the major pieces of non-coding DNA we need to be able to understand in order to crack the code. We need to be able to identify all of the enhancers for all of the genes so that we can understand our instruction manual. Now, I can tell you about one enhancer that probably plays a big role in how you feel about ice cream. So some of you are looking at this picture thinking, mmm, ice cream. <laughs> and others of you are looking at this picture thinking, Ice cream is so good, but what happens afterward is so bad. <laughs> so that second group of people is lactose intolerant. And the two groups of people <laughs> have different enhancers. Uh, so those two groups of people have different enhancers. We all have the gene for the enzyme lactase, which is what allows us to break down lactose, the sugar that's found in milk and ice cream. And 
It turns out that the version of the enhancer that turns off when you get older is the original version. So those of you that can enjoy ice cream, you can at least take pride in the fact that you are OG. <laughs> now, about 9,000 years ago, some humans started to uh, domesticate animals and herd them, so they had access to animal milk. And when somebody developed a mutation in the lactase enhancer that caused it to be stuck in the on position, they were able to use that extra source of food. So this was a huge advantage. And so we usually think of mutations as being a bad thing, but in this case, it was a good thing. So those of you that can eat ice cream, you're X-Men. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, okay. So, <laughs> so this was a huge advantage for the people that could uh, now eat milk. And so they developed, um, you know, they had more children, they lived longer lives, and so eventually this enhancer became common throughout the population. And this actually happened three different times at least in human history. And each time, it was just a single letter of DNA that was changed to cause the lactase enhancer to be stuck in the on position. So mutations and enhancers can give us superpowers, like being able to digest lactose, but they can also cause disease. So I want to come back to that analogy that I made earlier that non-coding DNA is like dark matter. So the final similarity is that the fact that we haven't cracked the code for non-coding DNA, we don't know how it works, is really starting to impede our progress. So there are geneticists out there that are working hard to identify the mutations that cause all sorts of common genetic diseases like heart disease, Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, asthma, and glaucoma. And to do this, they take advantage of the fact that we are all unique and special individuals, and we all have differences, and our genome is too, so we all have differences that make us different from each other, hundreds of thousands of differences. And so what they're doing is trying to sift through all of those differences to identify the ones that don't really cause us any problems and find the ones that are really harmful and causing disease. And so when they find a difference that's in a gene, because we have cracked the code for how genes make proteins, they're usually able to determine if that change, that difference, is harmful or not. Whereas if they find a difference in the non-coding DNA, because we haven't cracked that code, we can't tell if that difference is, and we also have to sort through all of that um, DNA of unknown function, it's very hard to tell if that difference is causing disease or not. And we've gotten to the point where we can't keep pushing this to the side anymore. So I'm going to tell you a little story about why this is such a problem. And it's about how uh, we identify mutations in children with rare diseases. So I'm sure you all know that the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is right around the corner, and they have one of the top pediatric genetics clinics in the world. And every day, families with children who have rare genetic diseases come through the door hoping that the scientists there will be able to help them identify the mutation, the, the mistake in the genome that's causing their child's disease. Because they hope that if they know what that mutation is, they'll be able to find a treatment or a cure. And so the, you know, the doctors at CHOP are amazing diagnosticians, and they start out by sequencing and looking for mutations in all the genes that have been previously linked to the symptoms that these children have. And if they don't find any change mistakes there, they'll do something called whole exome sequencing, where they sequence all of the genes, all of that 1.5% that codes for genes, makes proteins. Uh, but if they don't find any errors there, unfortunately, they have to tell families that, you know, we're sorry, we can't find mutation. We think it's probably in the non-coded DNA, but we don't know where it is. There's nothing else we can do. And this is really upsetting and frustrating for both the families and the doctors to not be able to find the answer. And the families can feel like they've you know, been robbed of hope. And so why don't we just sequence the non-coding DNA? We have the technology to do it, and genome sequencing has gotten a lot cheaper. But instead, the problem is being able to interpret the results. Because we haven't cracked the enhancer code, we can't identify mutations in the non-coding DNA and we can't read the instruction manual for our genes. And so until we can understand non-coding DNA better, 
Unfortunately, these families are going to be left without answers. So myself and others are working hard in the lab every day to understand how enhancers work. And the NIH thinks that this is an important problem to solve as well. They funded two big projects to help better understand non-coding DNA. And we are making progress. So recently, they've identified mutations in 10 different enhancers that cause lymph malformations, such as a child's hair with an extra thumb. And we've also identified mutations in an enhancer that contribute to uh, high cholesterol and heart disease. So if we can keep making progress like this, Hopefully the non-coding DNA won't be the dark matter of the genome for too much longer. Thank you.